All right, what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of Academics and Cars. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Please check us out at imixwhatilike.org and at imixwhatilike for all your relevant social media. And today for this edition, we're with my man, Dr. Nathan Connolly. Good morning, good morning. Of the Johns Hopkins University <laughs> here in Baltimore, Maryland. What's up, man? Welcome, man. I'm chilling, man. Thank you for having me in the ride. I appreciate it. Hey. So the, the pleasure is mine and will soon, as people will see, uh, will be ours if they're not already familiar with your work. Uh, These constant recurring narratives about how one goes about securing emancipation and getting free. And, and capitalism, contrary to what we imagine oftentimes on the academic left, capitalism is always a part of these formulations in some, in some significant degree because most people are like, look, we don't have the, the means to you know, have armed revolutionary struggle. We're not gonna necessarily be able to sustain anything beyond you know, helping to maximize and build communities through the market logics that we've already been given. So most people, are going through their day-to-day -day lives, trying to find ways to build what they can from these capitalist arrangements and relationships, right? So if you think about the 19th century or 18th century relative to chattel slavery, the 20th century relative to housing, we ought not be surprised when you see people working within these various economic arrangements to try to then create these niches of black autonomy and self-determination, right, right, right? Right, right? The problem is, that the game is rigged, right? So in the case of housing, you have African-Americans who are looking to secure home ownership, in some cases, rental properties. And what many of them are constantly running up against is the fact that the minute that wealth begins to accumulate by virtue of you know equity that they're trying to pay into properties, by virtue of African-Americans who are you know creating these constellations of institutions and networks and businesses, that white folk or other folks with the wherewithal recognize these as pools of capital capital move in and then begin to exploit these various collectivities, right? So, so the story of Jim Crow segregation is not one simply about separation, but it's about separation under the umbrella of white domination and control, right? And, and so there's a sense of, among many African-Americans that if we just get the separation part right, somehow then we'll be able to stop the white domination part. The problem is that white domination part is structural, right? And so whenever you think about- I'm And penetrates. Oh yeah, it penetrates like, these, these, these so various- you can't just set up these safe enclaves no. of blackness or whateverness. Never that, and, never and that. And think you're going to overcome this inability to isolate to overcome right right so is, so so be, so yeah. people are very good and this is and this is actually some of my, my more recent work now that i'm you know doing trying to write a really intimate look at what happens when you know very um well-meaning people of african descent mi migrate from the caribbean to europe from europe to north america from in various corners of the united states you know wherever wherever black folk decide to migrate mm -hmm. there's pretty soon thereafter a recognition that there's a market there right, right. That you can find ways to extract high profit margins by way of either durable goods by way of rents by way of other kinds of exploitation certainly you know fleecing and underground economies right there, there's a real recognition frankly that like wherever two black people are gathered therein is a market right, right. And, and and so i think part of what happens and this is where mercer's book is really you know telling is that these black banks basically end up becoming these reservoirs for them predation later on right, right. the freeman's bank as she, as she explains and as abram harris explained far earlier in the 1930s right that was a place where you know all of the black wealth in america was in this post-emancipation institution and a series of white bankers were like oh look we can now use this to buy junk railroad stock which they did in 1873 right black Black banks in general are seen as being places where you can have larger Wall Street banks simply peddle their products in the confines of these black communities, right? And so a lot of the so-called black-owned banks are now subsidiaries of the bigger firms that are down in Wall Street, right, as we now know. And this is where Mercer's work is really compelling. For me, you know, I think it's really just... And they're also, just simply put, trading in limited, woefully limited pools of resources. Right. So when you're talking about people pooling their resources in black banks, Black people don't have resources at the levels I think we're misguided into thinking mm -hmm. we have or, or propagandizing. So when you even try to do that, they're not the banks themselves, even if they were were trying to do something progressive or revolutionary, even are not dealing with the levels of 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 resources that would be required to overturn the inequality that exists. Right. And, and they're relatively small, as you were just pointing out right. before I interrupted you. No, no, no. These these bigger Wall Street 
banks now. Right, and 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 that, and that to me is one one of the big lessons that needs to always come out of you know a, a close look at say race and political economy is like look it's big capital versus small capital right in in, in most cases it's almost never socialism versus capitalism right, it ends right, up being right, like right, small right, capital right, versus big right, capital right, right, and that plays out the same way every single time right? right I mean it, it's it's like a drum beat and so you know in in, in the absence is that a Jay Z line big bank to little <laughs> I mean, bank I mean, I mean really <laughs> I mean so you know if, if, if we if we know that that's the template and you're still telling people create these small pockets of capital without actually changing the political procedures that make banking you know what it is as a largely predatory endeavor that make real estate you know based on segregation and the belief that equity is somehow the way in which you're supposed to somehow secure a nesting in the future rather than investing in robust public sector institutions having programs that are in place for education you know helping people with nutrition you know child care you know and so forth like there, there's a way in which you know by encouraging privatization as the model you basically have created this landscape of small capitalists that are always going to be gobbled up by big capitalists right and, and so so much of what I try to do is say look we tried a version of this believe it or not in the so-called high age of like Keynesian you know centralized managed economy you know great growth liberalism all that stuff that we think of as being the place we have to now get back to in the post 1970s era like let's get back to really good solid mid 20th century liberalism like that was the Jim Crow economy Right, we we have this weird pining for like the way in which you know you had governments that could manage resources, and they manage resources by driving interstates through black communities, by setting up various forms of asymmetrical policing, by creating obviously you know a dual set of institutions as the only way that most white Americans would even buy into the New Deal or buy into post-war growth was on a segregated basis, right? So all these things that the state helped to manage, which were again Jim Crow, pro-growth, displacement, that's kind of like not what we should be thinking about as the model for the 21st century economy or so how the end of, you know, what some are calling the neoliberal moment is to get back to an era of big centralized economic planning that was largely done at the behest of white interests in, in general and certainly the white capital in particular. Um, and so I, I, I feel it is it's very important, as much as we are able, to really go back and revisit some of the older debates about, um, you know, what exactly were, were the day-to-day -day compromises, existences, you know, trade-offs that define the Jim Crow era. But then also, you know, just to make a comparative point, what is it about the U.S. that has, in fact, long been deeply colonial and very much connected to the international processes that were, you know, hemming in the folks of the Caribbean, Latin America, Africa, and so forth? To me, it seems that there's a lot more possibility analytically, politically, and, and, and elsewhere um, in the conversation if we actually don't get caught up in a, a kind of, you know, pining for mid-20th century liberalism and its various promises, you know?